Sandra, welcome to the Femsplainers. Hello. <laughs> We're I'm so, so happy to be here. <laughs> Femsplaining. You are well, like here one virtually of, here. Yeah. One of the greatest Femsplainers. You, I see you're in your craftsman house in Pasadena with, as you've written about, the dead mice metaphor for. And yes. yes. <laughs> Um, I, I think there actually is still a rat trap here. Some, well, I didn't say the word rat, mouse. Just, yeah, no rats. Mice, that's what we call them. <laughs> well, I, I didn't know whether to, you know, when they say about books, that cliche, I, I laughed and I cried. I, I didn't know actually whether to laugh or cry with your book because I just so identified with it. And it made me a lot of the time just sad, even when you were being funny. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, yeah, it's true. I mean, uh, it was supposed to be a year in the life. Uh, my first book was, was called Depth, Depth Takes a Holiday many years ago, so many, um, I think almost 25 years ago. And it was an essay of a, a, a collection of short, funny essays about life, about the small things of life. So to a certain extent, this book was conceived of that same way. Mm -hmm. short funny essays about life except of course it's midlife so there's a little bit more of an emotional art journey in it just because if there isn't you're not really of a certain age <laughs> like not everything is laugh out loud funny but but yeah so so i think that and there's a little moment in the middle of the book where where somebody said and then suddenly i i just was st starting to weep why and it's about june commencement graduation season and that that's a little yes. bit built it. I mean, I guess our humor today as women of a certain age has, it's kind of like a certain kind of aromatherapy massage with just that little bit of what, um, cardamom in it or whatever that strange turmeric Clove. in it because that's, yeah, that's how we get our laughs now. It's a little crying and peeing. So Sandra, you're, I mean, that's perfectly apropos what you just said for what I wanted to talk to you about almost most from reading the whole book. I mean, it's fantastic. I, I love you, you sort of responding to the too muchness of everything. Um, right. But in particular, I wanted to, I wanted to talk to you about and have you tell us something about um, this, the, the exhausting nature of, of self care. Uh, you, <laughs> you used this wonderful phrase, um, personal sustainability. <laughs> Some kind of I don't know nuclear power plant, and we need to be sort of monitored and you know fed fuels and things all the time. You know, t talk about that because I think in the book you were, you're, it's just great that you're you're riffing on it. Well, I, I think um, okay, so so a little bit of the arc of it is I, I it was a, originally going to be called something like second world problems, which means I define as first world guilt on a third world budget, right? <laughs> which makes you all going to the farmer's market, you don't know why, because if you don't cook your family an organically grown vegetable thing, McDonald's wins. So you go there and they only take cash and you want basil and they always say it's out of season. I'm going, it's California, I don't understand. So that you're buying, you know, a lamb's ear and sorrel and all kinds of like kohlrabi that you that rot in your refrigerator. And then before you just go to churches, fried chicken and don't tell anybody about it. Churches is really good, by the way. So I think that in these, and, and as I would say, in the wonky part of it, the, the, of thinking, you know, Betty Friedan's The Feminine Mystique came out around 50 years ago. So Hillary Clinton's presidency was su su supposed to line up with all that. So that was kind of like the journey that we were all supposed to be on. So the idea was, and there's this great book I always quote, uh, The Capitalization of Feminism, where let's say in the 50s uh, men worked 40 hours a week and now women were going to join the workplace so women were going to humanize the workplace and the men were going to become more nurturing what could go wrong so it, instead of working 40 hours a week the men work 50 now the women work 60 and they spend more time with their kids than did 1950s stay-at-home moms during the week because <laughs> you know they don't ride their bikes anywhere in the neighborhood and they the women don't ring the dinner bell at seven and go come get your meatloaf and tater tots and your jello uh now <laughs> it's like women are work grinding so hard working like leaning in at their jobs leaning backwards into their marriages with the once a week date night um with the oprah lingerie and then trying to i don't know like do Pilates for this part and do the farmer's market stuff. And of course our children are all, all gifted and fragile, all of them, um, you know, especially yours or anyone listening to that, that you, your children are the most gifted. And then of course my dad also in this book, he's 97. 
it just will not become another life form and won't die. So, but to go back to your question uh, of, of that phrase, this is a chapter that is based on a real event, uh, which was Ariana Huffington's new book, The Sleep Revolution. And then they would, she was being thrown a book party. So Ariana Huffington, amazing to us all, suddenly she discovered this amazing new thing, wait for it, called sleep. <laughs> it's like, Sandra, like, like, Sandra, you're not getting enough sleep, Sandra. The gates of horn and ivory. Like, it's like, and, it, and, and I was noting this whole phenomenon because I'd reviewed another book from the New York Times of the, uh, the super achieving a uh you know type a executive female next door that somehow arian Huffington, who's unlike me in every possible way because i sleep like a champion it's kind of like and so does my whole family we already that's all we do um <laughs> it's a, except that now she counted it to self you know you know what in personal sustainability that you need to really sleep now but unfortunately even she screwed up sleep because now you have to sleep and then get up and write a TED talk now that you're so right. sort of. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes I would even like say words to myself when I'm trying to say, but like re refresh, restore, recharge. But even the word recharge is all, like, it's terrifying to think of it three or four in the morning. It's like recharge for what? What time am I getting up? Where am I flying? Am I flying to Davos? So that whole <laughs> cycle of what we call the personal sustainability, it's like another thing to add to your um, to do list, to your list. yeah yeah to sustain not just to sleep or eat chocolate or whatever or drink but, but to sustain and i had also reviewed another book um where another type a woman suddenly says you know what i learned to drop it's like drop the ball so just you know you had made out those invitations for the kids birthday party that you're throwing on an island so we're just like like let them go out three days late it's like i didn't even know that was a thing we were supposed to do. It's, it's like a, such a terrifying book of kind of like, stop cleaning the top of your refrigerator. Yeah. Went, like, uh, well, does anyone do that? And then I looked on the top of my refrigerator, it was hideous. I had never thought about that. So I think that's part of the women's journey. And that's a very long answer to your question. Of even when they invented those Biore strips, and then you see the black head, it's like, like capitalism, I think is very good at inventing ever new ways for women to worry well i like i like when you said this so i really identify with this when are we allowed to let ourselves go that that you know <laughs> as you say like back in the day we would have been in our 50s and we would just not be expected to go to all these fitness classes uh you know keep up a nice <laughs> appearance of course but this this I mean, what I loved about your, I want to also talk to you about your views of marriage, which um, not high on, but this idea that you once wrote that um, you, you didn't, you didn't, you got a divorce because you didn't want to go through the task of learning to fall in love with again, <laughs> love with yes. him again, because that was also yes. something more that you had to do. I mean, so when does right. it stop, Sandra? Right. When does this stop? When can we just let it go? So I believe the answer is at age 80, because I think there's been scientific studies shown that after the age of 80, you shouldn't lose weight, because that's called wasting. If you can gain weight, go for it. Also, you know, so just don't waste. Also, if your blood pressure goes up, that's better for your mental acuity. So I believe at age 80, things can real like that okay. can really maybe then we can go to the moos that we're not allowed to wear now as i say you know and you know that people will go you know sandra don't wear those floppy i call them the goddess pants which the are goddess. basically a like the, the goddess pants i have some here, where it's kind of an elastic waistline one size fits all sort of a pima bollywood harem dance pants and so i was so excited about these things like around my where, where i'm going I'm turning 56. What age is that? I don't know. It's just like a cheese and chocolate thing. And then my friends would say, what, what are those pants? And my, my partner said, you know, did a clown die? Or my, my 19 year old said the eighties cold, they want your, their pants back. So nobody would let me wear these pants. So they go, these are not the Eileen Fisher years. I go, they're all the Eileen Fisher years. <laughs> it's kind of, yeah. Why are we doing this? And again, it may still be driven by, Oh, I don't know, social media or, 
or capitalism or something that we're just kind of not allowed to go there. Well, but before, Sandra, before you came on, Danielle and I were talking about this. You know, the question really, uh, do you, when you hit your mid fifties, do you actually become invisible? Um, and Danielle was slightly leaning toward that side. Yes, so you're, you're, you become less visible in the world. But I, I'm inclined to the opposite view. And I think you, you proved my point with your story about those horrific pants. Um, and that is you're, you're almost too visible. Everybody sees you, your partner sees you or your husband, your children are watching you, people on the street see you, whatever. And everyone's got something to say. You know, you, 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 you're not allowed to, you, you, sorry, you cannot go into that good Eileen Fisher night. They won't let you, you know, you've got to, you got to keep it together for them. Um, and I, by the way, can I just say, I have a searing and personal anecdote about um, not goddess pants, but I, I had this idea once in a vintage store. This was, okay, I was in my late forties. And I, I saw a caftan and it was a vintage caftan that had, um, it had paisley on it. It was, there were elements of pink and green and other kind of mystical colors. And I just, I, and I, I, I saw this thing and I was thrilled. You know how vintage clothing is often very well made, right? So I thought, this is a beautiful piece of, you know, old 1960s attire. And I pictured myself wearing that floating around, serving like clinking glasses of whiskey <laughs> to my guests. And, and I, I bought it and I put it on at home and showed my family and one of my daughters <laughs> literally physically threw herself in front of the door of my changing, the, the room where I changed it. And she said, you can't go out in that. There's just no way you could do it. And it was, it was just such a painful illustration of this, the, you know, the inner me was this, you know, glamorous figure sweeping about. And from the outside, I looked like a clown had died and I had put on his clothes. <laughs> well, I think that's interesting, and that may that that may well be so. Both both the invisibility and the visibility. And I've certainly, boy, I, there's a much longer anecdote that would take four hours to tell and would require ten bottles of wine. But the short version, well, okay, a, a, a fivefold answer to the first and then to the second. I think yes. And our children are always looking at us. It's kind of like, and saying, did you use the right pronoun? Are you using paper towels, mom? Oh my God, is that a plastic straw? Jesus. So you're doing, to be this kind of mid fifties age is to be about that because it's kind of like a, a young baby boomer, late gen Xer to be in that generation. Um, so you're being tested constantly. And um, I think, and, and I have a friend who is approaching 80, a really full on boomer. And we have these conversations where she is not of the age where she gets tested by the young gender, like the age that we're at, um, of like, you know, are you using the pronouns or whatever. And so she considers herself, herself extremely liberated in sort of a Berkeley hippies protesting the Vietnam War way, but cannot, cannot ever even get a they pronoun. Like it, I've told her so many times, like is, that person is a they, my kids are they. And then she just can't get it, but do, doesn't even know that she's not getting it because she doesn't have these young people and like constantly looking at what, and giving you on a graded scale of what you're doing. I think also though, uh, because we're kind of in the role of mothers, there's a kind of funny invisibility, visibility of mothers. And so the longer anecdote that I won't tell all of was that last summer I was in a theater, um, uh, theater development, kind of one of the, kind of a summer camp. You, you know what I mean? One of those arts things over the summer. And I was actually sort of cast as sort of the elder, the wise elder with a bunch of younger playwrights. And it was interesting. Oh, isn't that to like see. the Hollywood role? You get the mother, you start getting the mother parts and like <laughs> <laughs> And what I noticed in this like it's a much longer like thing, but it's kind of like so at the meal time and we're being served by interns, I'm noticing I'm always the one that says hi, are you okay? That I'm making yeah. a lot of eye contact and doing the pleasing thing. And so what happened was when our critiques came up, it's kind of like everybody got love, 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 love. Oh, I just like, and then mine was the book. Like it's where they stoned mom. You're not hip enough. You're not, you know, he's kind of like, you're racist. I go, well, I'm a person of color. You're a transphobe. It's like, I have, like, 
<laughs> so the, it yeah. was interesting when women get a certain age, even the mother thing, I just know, and maybe I may like, uh, but I definitely saw like a mother thing. It was like, and then, and then I, I, I started apologizing to people for, I guess, how bad my play was. I, I mean, and I just kind of noticed that behavior within myself that maybe being both invisible and visible, what I find does work at this particular time of life is if you have to, if you're driving across town and you have to go to the bathroom and you, you just have to pee. And like, so if you go to a convenience store or something and they go, we don't have the key. I put on my, I call it my menopause face of the like, I am there. <laughs> and then they like move things very quickly because the scary menopausal lady, pair that with the, with, with a thrift store outfit and people will clear as quickly as possible. Well, so. I, this is where, that's, we were talking about this before you came on. I, I feel this sort of cultural hatred right now towards what we're calling the Karens. And it, it, as we said before, you know, yeah. my kids were saying, you're not but that meme, mom. But, but we are kind of all that meme that, that. Um, yeah, I think it's a really, actually, it's a really hurtful and dismissive meme that's not called out by anyone of the, yeah, of the Karen, yeah, of the people who kind of look at their neighborhoods, they, you know, say, pick up your trash or, blah, blah, blah. you know, it's like, it's really, I, I think it's a really harmful, it's a really hateful Mm. Well, but it's also, I guess, it put, it, it's, it's this middle-aged demographic because, as you were just saying, maybe it's better to be just written off as too old to change because that seems to be the next phase. It's like, they're not going to criticize us anymore because, oh, that's grandma. Oh, my God. She's, give her a martini, you know. Um, she's just yeah. an old racist. <laughs> she doesn't get it. But she means well. She yeah, is just, yeah, she's I, yeah. okay. And 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 you're waiting for the money from the grandparents to come, like yeah. So, so yeah. and some conveniently are across the country. They send tuition money for the kids to go to their liberal arts colleges, etc. But they they know that it, you know that's just where the money comes from, right? Um, Maybe. Can Can you talk about uh, what I some of my favorite parts of your book were your wine sessions. W I N E, but I guess W H I N E <laughs> sessions with your best friends. <laughs> And there were revelations there for me about middle-aged men um, that first you, you, this was a total revelation to me that, that many middle-aged women complain of not getting sex anymore. And I always thought like the, the, the <laughs> meme or the cliche is that, you know, the women have given up, but there are just marriages where there is nothing. And that was a surprise to me. And then you also talked about um, these husbands, this sort of phenomenon of the house husband who is always in there cooking. And as you notice, he's an excellent house husband, but a lousy housewife. And it's in this dynamic where the, the, the woman is really working harder, the 60 hours, earning more money, and she's coming home and she's got like, he's got garlic simmering on the stove for some bespoke sauce, but, but he hasn't changed light bulbs. Like, so talk about this little sort of middle age. I mean, you, you live with someone, right? You have for a long time. So, so maybe from what you observe in these middle age marriages, and then maybe why you've decided not to jump back in that bubbling pot. Boy, that is a, that's a great question. It's so multifaceted. Um, so I'll, I guess I'll, I'll do a little intro and then go to this section. So my earlier book, The Mad Woman and the Volvo, My Year of Raging Hormones, was basically, I, I was, and as described in, I guess, the marriage piece that you're quoting in The Atlantic. So I was 46, I did, okay. So I was kind of a late mother, had birth, gave birth 38 and 40, like the National Geographic turtle washing up on the beach with their last leathery eggs, as I like to say. So I then, in the early 40s, it was big revolution. We're going to change our schools and I'm baking pies. And I got the sudden hormone uplift of, of having the young children. And then by 46, and I had actually staged a political protest about government funding in front of the Sacramento Capitol, to which we rented RVs. I mean, it was this explosion of hormonal energy. Then I go, now I can drive an RV. Let's go to Burning Man to see the art for my sister's 50th. Um, and then of course, once we were at Burning Man, we came, brought my platonic friend, who's my theater producer partner of 10 years, um, to you know, help us build a camp shower and drive, yeah. um, which he did. And then, 
And then one of my girlfriends goes mad as we walk around the planet. It's the big thing of sand. It's the truth serum where she goes, uh, great news. Recently, I found my G-spot. And I go, fantastic. And she goes, but not with the husband. <laughs> like, oh, no. So we were all the PTA moms that had brunches together and our kids swam in the same pools and et cetera, et cetera. And then it was kind of like the first little dot of black ink in the pond of you are actually having an affair. What? And she said, yeah, and I'm really horny. And you know what? Tonight I'm going to have sex with like my partner who's upstairs. And, and I started thinking, wow, that's really bold. What a great idea that would be. I didn't know that he was available for, if I knew the, the door of the sex pantry was slightly ajar, I could kind of steal a little kind of jar of pickles. <laughs> like It's kind of like, we're at Burning Man. It's kind of like, maybe just a camp snuggle before I go home. You know, so that opened at that particular time. And that was kind of a midlife crisis. They call it like a female midlife crisis. It used to be just the men would turn 40 or 45, get the red Ferrari and the hairpiece yeah. and the secretary girlfriend named uh, uh, Jennifer. Vanessa. Uh, uh, <coughs> typically, Vanessa. <laughs> and now the women were able to do it because they were more financially independent. So that everybody goes through, can go through a midlife moment where they go, and I, you know, I was so deeply in love, uh, you know, madly in love at 46, if you could, that crazy teen, like, yeah. and, and he also felt that back. It was, you know, um, it, it was mutual. So you go, if at 46, I can find this kind of love, uh, I might, I should go for it because I'm going to live to 90 and that marriages now last so many more years. I mean, I think the life expectancy in 1900 was about 49. So most menopausal women were of course dead. Uh, but uh, so, so I think if you can go for it then, but what happens in other marriages um, and other, I talk to other people, many more than you would think who from the outside, their marriages look really good. The children are gifted and they're into sports and they have a routine and they, their home is beautiful and they're for all the right causes, et cetera, et cetera. But that inside, somebody's thinking of having an affair, someone is having one. The, at, the, you know, at night, the twin laptops go up in the eerie glow. They don't talk at night. They, and, um, but it, it, often it's just too much to uproot the children's schedules and the home and we we've been talking before we started about debt <laughs> kind of like how much debt or like how would we even break up that debt so yeah. there is a lot of that and so and what happens is sometimes the women get more energized as they go on and then the men become like less more into their another their world war ii you know documentaries and their collecting of their strange wooden boats etc cetera, etc cetera. um but then some and that what because your question was long and my answer is even longer, so I'll stop. But the thing about men cooking fi fills me with such insane rage that we have Michael Ballen and, and like, you know, and I, I was too angry to really actually read any of the loads books, but my sense for all, is kind of like, well, slow food, if you don't have time to slow down and make that simmer sauce, it's because you don't care. As like, like yeah. and so the men have taken on this artisanal simmer sauce making with the the sink fills with a mandolin and the special tongs and the gear and all that kind of stuff. Yes, the light bulbs will be changed, et cetera, et cetera. And and it's kind of like and as we said in that section of the book, it's kind of like well, I do so much driving. The day that they invent a car where there's a crock pot in the dashboard is when I'll start slow cooking because it's just like I spend so much time in the car driving people around. I'm sorry about the planet, but I live in Los Angeles and this is the way our, our things are set up. And also when you see someone like Alton Brown, and this will be at the end because I know this has been a bit of a tirade, but no, when you see someone like Alton, Alton Brown or Alton Brown on his show, it's always the stainless steel. It, the, the kitchens are as clean as surgery, like a surgery like station. And there's never, he never has to run back to the store for the one thing. There's never a dog that runs through or a wet child screaming. He's always in this kind of mystical biodome of checking the temperature of the salmon in the middle. And, he, and then magically the dishes are washed and disappear. Whereas women for decades and centuries and I know my mom had kind of a you know the, the mom get the bad reputations so like oh my mom was a bad cook my mom hated to cook she made mac and cheese out of a whatever and you know what other things she, she was doing a ton of she was also doing the laundry at the same time so why don't they have a thing where the men put the pasta on to boil and then they kind of sort socks 
in the laundry yeah, while yeah. waiting for them. Because they're food. chefs, Sandra. They're not just cooking. They're <laughs> chefs. Right. So, so I, I, I just want to be very clear about something. Um, are, are you saying, Sandra, because it sounds like you are, that, um, that sex goes out of a marriage when a husband does too much cooking? That's really hilarious. I mean, there actually has been. Is there something so sort of a little, maybe a little too feminine, a little too relaxed, a little too domestic about these dudes, and they're worried about their basil, and and maybe they would know what to do with the kohlrabi, um, <laughs> right? But 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 there's what what's in it for the wife then? You know, like I don't know. Draw make the connection here for me. Well, okay, there has been one study that the more you know, and and then for a while, like on the Oprah show, there was an Oprah thing of like the best foreplay is for him to empty the dishwasher, like, and then I'll have sex with him. It, I think <laughs> they've done studies, and it turns out that is not true. It, it, it would seems, not, I think, work. It seems statistically <laughs> that women get turned on by men not doing, not emptying the dishwasher or not putting the girly apron on and doing the simmer sauce, but seeing him mow the lawn or <laughs> shirtless. <fix> car. Shirt <laughs> and I always have this thing, and it's in, in like refinishing the wooden floors. It's like the yeah. wooden floors need refinishing. How about you and a bunch of guy friends, like in your, like do it on a weekend? <laughs> None of them will do that anymore because, oh, the back, you just can't, oh, yeah. Just gotta, and then there's a struggle even to get them to break, get their shit off the floor and you can edit that or what. Are there unread New Yorkers off the floor so that you can get a pile of people to finish the floors that you research yourself? So, um, so I think it just, it may be something that, that changes, um, not that men cooking, but they do get into it in a really weird, um, like Talmudic study way that's very aha. And they went, and I know that my partner was reading a James Beard recipe where to make the perfect scrambled eggs takes two hours. Because uh, it's a very low heat. Yeah, and you have to constantly <laughs> stir it. And yeah, it, it, it's Constant delicious. stirring. Well, it, it's, it's monastic. Like, it's as if men are invading, it's like, life mansplaining like they're coming into our spaces and they're showing us how we should be doing it better and um i i just as an aside we have a longtime bachelor friend very very successful keeps it going by having a series of very attractive intelligent women in his life but he's found someone he seems a little more serious about and we're talking and he said he sort of nodded he goes you know she just makes things so nice i mean it's just it's almost homey. And I was like, that's our brand. You know, like, that's, that, that's what we do. Um, uh, don't be surprised. Yeah, we bring candles in, you know, we, we, we do that kind of thing. But, but we, what we're at really is a, a reckoning at this age. And we're sort of on the top of, of some sort of mound or mountain looking back and forth. And one of the sort of compelling themes of your book is this sense that well we're let, we're not the people in the crystal cruise um ad you know uh flyers that come in catalogs that come in the house those those slay me although i guess there won't be crystal cruises for a while but you know that silvery couple i think you hear the pale linens and they're they've got their glass of wine and they're like <laughs> and they're going to, you know into athens and things or ruins and and you think <laughs> that's not me and my kids aren't those other kids in you know um some other catalogs that you, you, one of the most searing uh chapters where you or essays you're talking about taking your kids to lunch with a couple that sounds like they could have been in the crystal cruise catalog and just feeling yeah. oh my god we're also inadequate my children are inadequate they're not you know it's why aren't they trying to choose between stanford and yale i mean you know, i'll be lucky if my kids even get to call like talk about a little bit of the disappointment <laughs> Well, I mean, one one way to um, interpret a little bit of that is so this is also a, partly a book about Asianness, and it's in a very low key way because, but I think that's part of. So my father is fully Asian from Shanghai, immigrant, science, science, science. I am half Asian, so a little watered down, and as I like to say, I went into the liberal arts, which to a Chinese father is like pole dancing. <laughs> That's a joke on that. My kids are one quarter Asian. So that means like my older daughter is blonde, but
but there's something with the eyes where you go, that reminds me, are those almond eyes? So they're interested in art and psychology and cartooning and memorizing lines from sitcoms that are, would not be shown today because now they would be so politically incorrect. And it, annoying voices, and they just kind of like, they were, woo. So this particular couple you're talking about is somebody who did, and the theme of education is one that goes through this also. And certainly the idea that, um, you know, my kids, they will never go to Yale. They, they, there's no way. Because, not because they're not intelligent, but like we have not played the right sports. They don't play any sports. <laughs> So, so to start there, you were on, not on crew or lacrosse or any that we start learning in slow motion of kind of like, you should have started back in sixth grade, like doing the PSAT because you, you have not volunteered in the important places. You have not gone to Cambodia to like, oh my God, it's kind of like to learn suddenly be shown that we were of a different class, which was in this particular lunch or meal that you're describing. And, um, <clears throat> and, and that we're becoming the wrong kind of Asian. Uh, which is also back to back with this funeral thing where my grand uncle, who is a great Chinese painter, died. And of course, my immigrant family goes to um, Forest Lawn in not a fancy part of, of LA, where what, you, know, you're, you go to the open gravesite, people in coveralls explain the plot number, and then the truck backs up to tamp down the grave with a big tamping tool that goes ding, ding, ding. <laughs> it's, like, it's like, and then we go to lunch at a restaurant with the smeary pig snouts and the plastic as like, we are not the right kind of Asian uh, to be aware that we're downwardly mobile Asians, which is also true of my, my partner who's a wasp, downwardly mobile wasp. So I think this moment, and, and, so, and a little bit of that is, a little bit of that is class maybe. I mean, I really not thought about the question the way you put it. But with those cruise, the crystal cruises and the and the dry cleaning linen, white linen and a red glass of wine, I go, how does, and you're on a boat. I don't even know. <laughs> um, and, and so part of that may have been, you know, I call uh, the late boomers or I used to call the downwardly mobile professionals or the dumpies back in the, when I was in my 20s. Uh, we had just missed the real estate boom, the BMWs, the Rolexes, et cetera, et cetera. And now it was like a, a Hyundai scoop. And IKEA furniture was the big revelation of my generation. I wrote a piece in Buzz the, Magazine called The Billy Bookcase. The Billy Bookcase. We all had the Billy right. Bookcase. Book yeah. <laughs> exactly. Twice. Yeah. <laughs> well, you have to because they're not water resistant, even though they go <laughs> like, oh my God. And they collapse, they kind of like start melting, like, even though you have a house to furnish, they're yeah. in May. The, 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 the center is. <laughs> <laughs> like, like cardboard, yeah. sort of. Sort of melting. So I think that's kind of the, the thing of being in an in-between place. And also here you can see we're aging bohemians. We're just, so we still think of ourselves of, you know, the cat peed on the thing, throw a pashmina shawl all over. And you can actually see, look at my living, and there's the massage chair right there. It's still, it's, it's still kind of a mat. Like you, you, you say that's our brand. Yeah, this is, you're pointing nicer, to those. Like, to those listening, some of the, this will be on uh, YouTube as well, but yes, you've got this sort of craftsman background and you're blocking but it's what messy looks like and that elder chair in the back that you're going to, you get that Barca <laughs> lounger that's going to get the, uh, you it's know. It's a massage chair. It's the Costco <laughs> massage chair where I go, I didn't give a flying whatever. I'm going to buy it. And it's in my living room and people sit in it all the time. So maybe part of maybe the, let's say the joy of this time of feeling I have an 85 year old's body with the bank account of a 25 year old, or, or like say, my bank, my banker called and he said, I have the IRA of a 25 year old. Of the in-between spaces, maybe where you stop caring about certain, you can't care anymore yeah. because it's all out the gate anyway. And to a certain extent, I think even, even culturally, and I think a lot of that Paul Fussell's, Paul Fussell's book, Class, yeah. many years ago, and to a certain extent, I would love to write an update of that, which is, Times reporter like suggested to me because all the stuff we used to care about it's kind of like what is culture now anyway what does yeah. going to the right school really get you now in, in a time where I know Harvard graduates are you know sitting out in summer in quarantine going what do I do you know it's it's sort of it's all up for grabs now it sort of seems you know uh, Sandra when I was reading your book um, as I read through you know January 
and February, and I came to March, and I actually felt a little clutching in my throat. I thought, oh, she doesn't know it, but she's going to go into quarantine. And of course, the book is not about this year. But, you know, there is something about the way the calendar has, you know, everybody's life came to a stop on about, on or about March 13th, right? Yeah. 13th, 14th, that week, that was the weekend when suddenly yeah. it kind of gripped us all back to the throat. Um, I, I would love to know, how are you holding up yourself? Um, I, I expect you've been taking copious notes. Oh, well, horribly, I would say. No, I would go, yes, I've been very productive. I've been writing oh. a book and I, I set it, I've built an entire herb garden in back and I've like, uh, like some people have done that. Some, some of my friends, yeah. they remodeled a bathroom and they're just loving being at home and it's like they're reading sort of to each other at night and can't like, it's like, so I think, I think for me, I just realized I started becoming, un, when I saw the layers of myself peel away as layers of an onion week after week, that I did, I think like many people, I took for granted how, I, I sort of call it, you know, and this would sound politically incorrect again, but the, the ADHD kind of nature of life as we knew it. And one mm -hmm. of the big things for me turned out to be going to the gym, because even though I'm not buff at all, as a writer who's pretty sedentary, um, it's like even two days a week of spinning class of kind of like, I'm gonna try to get the better parking place because I have an electric car now. So that was like a game. And then getting the good parking stamp and then getting the bike that you have to sign up for and all the anxious middle-aged people and their kind of weird tattoos and their titanium water bottles and their Lycra pants. And we would go, her name is Rio and she dances on the sand. Like kind of to the, to the boomer music and then steam, pretend to stretch. And and then steam and then pump the keels products which is kind of like cardio it was kind of like and then when that was gone then life became really flat where i couldn't even go to the park it's kind of like yeah. let's go to the park uh, i don't even like going to the park and do calisthenics or go to a trail or whatever so stuff started really slowing down a lot to a point where one day went into the next and it's hard again if you're a writer already you're you're sedentary to to mark um these things and i think also, what I've noticed, and many of us have recently started talking about this, although this is the first Zoom of the day, of like the zoo, weird Zoom exhaustion, because yeah. now all these meetings are back to back. We're in each other's faces, literally. And we used to complain about traffic in Los Angeles. Not we realized sitting in the car, going from one place to the next was a kind of respite when yeah. you're yes. in your car, listening to whatever you want, and you get breaks, and now we don't. How so I think, but I'm, I'm longing to write the, the mad woman and the pandemic, which was totally be kind of, I've been taking like notes on and gaining the quarantine 20 and the grief weight and all of that, which has also been part of it. I, I just like to call it the COVID-19. <laughs> <laughs> and 19, you know, that's pretty good. That's really not bad. It's like, oh my God. Well, you took so, a and corny... So you took up corny yoga, right? Like you even, you, cause you, you wrote an essay, you, you're, you've been hit. I mean, we've all been hit in different ways, but you've been hit, you got you've been quite depressed and you, you took up this, followed this yoga guru. And the best thing about her, you've noted that she's not at all challenging. It's not scary. It's not like those spin <laughs> classes with the savage women on the other bikes, um, like biker That's chicks. True. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it's, um, yeah. But, but you were you just like hug yourself or <laughs> work yourself no, as a child's I, pose or something. And you seem to, do, you like that. Yeah, doing that a lot. And I think the sense of purposelessness, especially at the beginning where you go, what can I do? Can I make masks for emergency workers? No, because I have poor motor skills and I don't know how to make them. And um, I'll just with my sweaty infected hands, send people shit that doesn't work. And like, so it was slowly let, you know, and, and, and so the news kept saying, don't even, there's a California search, don't even go to the grocery store this week. Mm -hmm. We go, well, are there sick people at the grocery store? And then we we're going, no, it's probably because if you, with your mask and your gloves, if you stub your toe against your cart, then you have to go to the emergency room. And like, oh, like, so it's like the best thing you could do is just lie in bed like a blob and hug your pillow and, you know, you can drink rosé all day and watch Game of Thrones or uh, you know uh, what the zombie one, The Walking Dead, uh, but then don't slip when you go to the bathroom and stub your toe. So it was kind of like this, this, just don't go anywhere, don't do anything. And so people start just getting on social media and getting really kind of, it, it, it looped in their own head. So I thought this yoga with Adrian thing, 
it, it was just really yoga with Adrian. Yes, and so you and a friend of mine got me on it, and it's like day one. Gentle. We're just gonna breathe three times, and you go namaste, and go. That's it. I can do. I, that. I can do that. So, yeah. And, <laughs> <laughs> and day eight of gratitude is just hugging yourself and a pillow, which I do now in the shavasana. Like so, that's happened. But now I just because I don't have to please anyone anymore. Uh, I I did get a peloton. I joined the oh, evil yeah. nation of Peloton, the yuppie, crazy, whatever. I ordered it in April, and it, they said, well, it's going to come in June. And back then I go, then I don't want it because if we're still in quarantine, in, like, no, we're going to be going back to the gym, no. And then it finally came. So now I'm the oldest and fattest person on a Peloton bike. And, <laughs> and, uh, and it is just really, and here's the thing. If You've you got that glass it, of I, wine I, and a cigarette, you know. <laughs> granny and the martini, and I can't remember anybody's names or anyone's pronouns. Um, so, but it is kind of, if you're not on it, and I don't want to make a sales pitch, but it's, it's kind of like, I never feel like exercising in the morning. You get on the bike and it's like you put your quarter in and the, steel thing lifts <laughs> there's there's a very attractive cute young person male or female going hello let's do a, a jolly parton ride or let's let's do a disco for 20 minutes and come on come on Bill. and so they're all very young and attractive well most of them are well they're all young and attractive and so they kind of you who you on so that's part of a i think that's also sort of just emotionally disturbing when i think about it so but, so so sandra um, from the wisdom that you have acquired in the, in the heights of your goddess-like middle age, um, give us advice, will you? What would you give, what advice would you give to us? What advice would you give to your own daughters or to our daughters even better um, about how to live a life of uh, serenity, um, purpose, meaning, uh, etc., as interpreted through the Mad Woman and the Roomba? Wow. That's a terrifying question, even though it, it was like an Amazon <laughs> life management is yeah, the yeah, no, you category that it's in. <laughs> so, ooh, wow. All right. Um, I would, and this just ugh, the week that I've had already, I would say, um, uh, okay, and this will be, I, I do think I have, I, it's true, I've worn nothing but goddess pants through the entire pandemic because I just, anything with a we're button. All, we're, all waist, like, we're all in goddess pants. We're all in goddess pants now, <laughs> even men. But that has, that has been <laughs> sort, of, sort of freeing. So that, that, that's been the weird thing, even though on Zoom you're only seeing this far up, mm -hmm. um, that's been actually kind of freeing not to think about that stuff for a while. Even though, yes, as I'm like, like uploading CNN, I can notice kind of like, why is my belly hitting my legs? Like my <laughs> boobs, they're used to what? It's like a new friend, the, the COVID-19. Um, so so I, I think I, if, if there's a way, I, hmm, I, I, if there's a way to lower expectations as a group and agree on how mad the world is, as was already true in the Mad Woman and the Roomba of, of just the madness of trying to do the, the Pilates and the Kohlrabi and the, and the this and that, to just, um, you know, I, I, I went, I was asked, how do you do it all? And I go, you work and you write and you have these kids. And I go, okay, well, you should look at the inside of my car. <laughs> it, is, it is like an insane, crazy person lives there because there's stuff all over. That's where it all goes away, like coffee cups and empty water bottles. I mean, it really looks like like a, a scavenger or somebody who's, you know, maybe, yeah, but yeah. Uh, so, so to let some of that stuff go, you want to say something? Yeah, I do. I, I, I think that, that was a terrible question. I don't blame you for can Danielle, can we, can we have a redo on that question? No, I was enjoying it. I was loving her. Oh. I was loving your answer. <laughs> I know. I think. I think you're right. It's about letting it go, and not in that Ariana Huffington. We go to sleep. Then we do the the TED talk. That was so brilliant. Like I don't. I can't. I can't do this. Okay. Just one more thing that I would say to that, and then you can see if you want to re or whatever. Because I I think that just the bar is super 
low right now yes. and maybe accepting that the bar is soup there aren't, there aren't good days and bad days there's there's bad days and miserable days. they're all kind of gray even though there are moments of some cool things that have happened in this time like spending more time with their children that wouldn't have happened before but i think for me because i've been like thinking about it a lot because we're now the quarantine seemed like it i had gone through the five kubla ross stages of grief, loss, and denial, and now it seems there are going to be 24 Kubler-Ross right. stages, and right. it may go on for a day, like, what is, so many things are being lost, so I think, uh, uh, just, it can be helpful to just accept that there, many of us are depressed, and I'm, it's not really, oh, and so how do you do that, it's kind of like the belly breathing, hugging the pillow, and staying in bed as long as you can, in goddess pants, yeah. No, I think I think that's I think that's right. I think it's it's it, it has slowed down a maniacal world. I mean, we've all had to accept our roots now are going to show and and you know, I, I think our mutual friend Caitlin Flanagan said it's all Dorian yeah. Gray now in Los Angeles with all these women <laughs> having their actual faces back and not being able to put fillers and botox and things. So so I think there is a kind of philosophical thing but as you said at the beginning of the pandemic where you're thinking, well, what can I do for my country? You could stay home and watch Netflix. You go, okay, that's easy, but what can I really? And, and it's been very difficult that way. It, it has been hard to feel that you can accept, wear a mask, you know, and don't be a jerk about it. It's, it's, it's been hard to figure out anything to do that feels meaningful. So being yeah, easier on yourself is good. I think it's good, but also as women, there there is a thing of having gone through again these fifty years, you know, where I I would say in co I went to college in seventy nine to eighty three. So female liberation meant that instead of the guy asking you out on a date and paying for dinner and picking you up and giving you flowers, who wants those? Um, flowers. Uh, you had to go yeah. Dutch at the local <laughs> macrobiotic restaurant. Uh, you had to have sex on the first date because otherwise you were frigid. An independent woman carried her own contraceptives, which was the whole horrible diaphragm with the corn powder or whatever it was. Um, and then you had to, in the morning, you'd probably give him 20 bucks because he was trying to find his way through poetry or drumming. So it's kind of like, that was liberation? What? Like that was another set of chores. And then, and now, as you said, apologizing to our kids for not having the right pronoun, et cetera, et cetera. So there has been a thing of, of going through this journey as women while holding all these different things together. And of course my book dropped on June 2nd, which was Blackout Tuesday. And so of course we moved everything of like, a, you know, kind of canceled and postponed stuff for this moment that is, you know, obviously a huge, important national conversation, but it is a little bit of, of just trying to stay out of the way or stay quiet, you know, uh, and, and so I think that's a little bit of a journey now too of, yeah, a feeling like what, what can one do? I know certainly I'm frustrated by schools going back and certainly that's a, that's a, you know, people of color, um, important thing our public schools in LA are you know 70% or, or, or less than 10% 10, 10 white so it's kind of like that's something that really haunts me but I also don't quite know what to do with that except for volunteer remotely so it, it, it is a hard it, it is a hard time to as opposed to that pussy hat moment where it's like we're knitting hats and marching yay right. <laughs> hard to feel purposeful like, now it's it is exactly yeah, yeah. All right, Sandra. Well, this has just been such a pleasure. Um, so, so great to even virtually meet you. Huge fans, long time of your writing. I mean, I still, I went and reread that essay on divorce, but I, it, it's still seared in my brain that <laughs> you wrote in the Atlantic, I think in 2009. <laughs> but, um, but thank you. Such, such, and, and, and the book is wonderful reading and it's, it's a wonderful distraction right now which we also yeah, it's, it's like, it's like a delicious refreshing reminder of what the world used to be like all those crazy problems that were kind of fun now in <laughs> <retrospect. That's right. laughs> except for the Roomba which still circles right. and my that was circles. the one choice I made that was a good one for now the Roomba. <laughs> all right Sandra well, thank you so much we really appreciate it